you know, I would like to thank, uh, you know, uh, Thomas for, uh, you know, joining us today. And thank you for sharing, uh, uh, moderating this meeting. Uh, we are really excited to uh, have everybody join. I see the numbers uh, going up really fast. So I'll just pass you the ball and uh, let you uh, lead the meeting today. So, and thanks Ashley for helping us organize uh, all these events because uh, without you, I don't know what we would do. <laughs> Great, yes. Um, thanks to Ashley and thanks to Thomas um, so much for coming and thanks to UConn for hosting this seminar. Um, just you can see up on the screen, there's a announcement about our next seminar in March from um, Dr. Melissa Wong from OHSU. And um, I hope that people will be able to attend more information about that meeting will be forthcoming. So um, it is my great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Thomas Kisslinger um, to our Cancer Early Detection Seminar Series. Um, Dr. Kisslinger received his master's in analytical chemistry from the University of Munich. Um, he got his PhD in 2001 looking at the role of advanced glycation end products in diabetic vascular complications at the University of Erlangen in Germany and also at Columbia University. Um, from there, he moved to Canada to Toronto to do his postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto. And in 2006, he joined the Princess Margaret Cancer Center as an independent investigator. Since that time, he's really risen through the ranks and um, currently holds positions as a senior scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, and also as professor and chair at the University of Toronto in the Department of Medical Biophysics. Um, his lab applies proteomic technologies to translational and basic cancer biology, um, and has developed a lot of novel proteomics methodologies, um, identifying new liquid biopsy signatures and molecular identification of cell surface markers. Um, I've been following his work for a long time. We work in very similar fields, and um, Dr. Kissinger and his lab have done really beautiful and seminal work in cancer proteomics, and they're really leaders in this field. Um, some examples, which I'll just name very briefly um, to kind of put the work that he's doing into a larger context, uh, looking at proximal fluids um, for prostate cancer biomarkers in urine and prostatic secretions. Um, he's done a lot of multi-omic analysis for head and neck cancer, glycoproteomics analysis of ovarian cancer, exosomes and membrane proteomics, and um, developed a lot of both methodologies and informatics tools in the field. So we're really excited today to hear about um, some of his work on the fluid-based biomarkers for ovarian and prostate cancer. And thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Sharon. Much too nice of an introduction. Hopefully I can hold up the bar now. <clears throat> so anyhow, let me see if I can get this into, okay, can you see it? I guess you can. So um, thanks again for inviting me and for this um, um, really nice um, invitation. And what I will do here is, what I will do, first show you, for those of you that don't know me, here just a little bit of an, of an overview of what, what the lab does. So we kind of, you know, dwell in three um, different um, themes. So kind of we're an unfocused bunch. Um, and so there's always, as an analytical chemist, we always do a little bit of technology development. I call it more technology tweaking, uh, where we use, you know, methods that others have developed and try to implement them into our kind of questions and setups. And here you can see we work on enrichment, um, targeted quantification, proteogenomics, and most recently, <clears throat> maybe ultra low input, not so much single cell, but ultra low input proteomics. And we, we always package them in kind of real biological questions. So all these methods, we usually don't publish them independently, but they're all in our papers. So you can go in there and see how we do our things. Then the main focus of the lab um, is certainly on cancer biomarkers and cancer biology. And then, um, as Sharon said, kind of near and dear to my heart since my postdoc is kind of combining subcellular fractionations or cell biology um, with mass spectrometry. And we're particularly interested nowadays <clears throat> in mapping plasma membranes. And this is both for finding new markers and studying them painfully in classic molecular biology, but also in the context of finding potentially new um, therapeutic targets. 
for antibody drug conjugates or CAR T cells, et cetera. And since this is a, a biomarker seminar, I will speak mainly about um, biomarker of uh, liquid um, based biomarkers today. I'll give you a quick an overview of some published data uh, where we use PDX models in the context of ovarian cancer without completely belaboring this, and also show you where we are going with this um, technology moving forward. And then I show you mainly unpublished data. So we've been working on prostate cancer biomarkers for probably 12, 13 years. And recently, um, everything we learned, we put into one very large project, actually over 1500 samples have now been analyzed. So this isn't done. I'll show you some snippets of this and some vignettes. Probably won't be exactly how it will be in the eventual publication, but gives you kind of an idea um, how we're thinking about these challenging problems. All right, so let's start with the uh, ovarian cancer um, program and quick background. So epithelial ovarian cancer is the most common type of ovarian cancers and ranks fifth among cancer-related death among women. It has the highest mortality of all gynecologic cancers uh, in women and, and they can be subdivided in five histological subtypes. You can see them here um, on the right-hand side in this pie chart. Um, each of these can probably subdivide it, can be subdivided in multiple molecular subtypes. And, you know, big consortia such as TCG or CPTAC have shown us that. We are particularly interested in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which is the most prevalent and also the most aggressive subtype um, of, of these um, epithelial ovarian cancers. Most of these cancers unfortunately present in an advanced stage, so they're very silent in an early stage and there are no real obvious symptoms to the patients. When they present, they have massive kind of tumor load in the abdominal cavity with basically metastasis through the entire abdominal space, the liver, the omentum, et cetera. So it initiates kind of in a interesting way. So initially these, these EOCs were thought to originate from the ovarian surface epithelium. Now, most investigators think it actually initiates at these fimbrial ends of the fallopian tube. From there, it goes to the, to the ovary. And then very early uh, in the progression of this disease, um, ovarian cancer spread through the entire abdominal cavity, as I said. And that presentation, hundreds or thousands of foci uh, in these women. So, if you think about that for a bit, so that makes kind of early detection a really tough problem, right? You would need to catch it at this stage where they're still in the fallopian tube or possibly um, at the ovarian surface epithelium. So there's very low tumor load and probably most methods nowadays will have challenges detecting it at that stage. And here you can just see, so this is what this looks at presentation. It's really, uh, bad disease um, for these patients, right? And surgeries take hours over hours to try to debulk um, as much tumor as possible from these women. <clears throat> so here, just summary, here's how a uh, standard of care works at the moment. So in first line, it's usually surgery. So aggressive debulking surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy with, you know, platinum taxol based um, treatments. Not much has changed. Um, in that context in the last decades. And then following surgery, uh, FDA approved biomarker C125. So it's, it's mucin 16 as the gene um, or serum levels of this are, are used to monitor um, surgery. So it's FDA approved following surgery. And you can see here on the right hand side, like a typical curve of what C125 looks like through progression of this disease. So most women, not all, but most, present with high levels of C125 following surgery and chemotherapy that goes down into a remission state. They're in that state for a, for a while. Most of these patients also respond to first line therapy reasonably well. Eventually it will rise. These patients become often resistant to treatment and, and pass away from, um, from this disease relatively bad. So you can see here, most of them actually recur within about two years. And as a result of this overall survival, five-year survival is 10 to 30%. And even with new treatments that, that recently came into the clinic, anti-angiogenic um, PARP inhibitors, immunotherapy, that overall survival has not changed much 
um, in, in the last decade. So we are interested actually not in early detection, but in this kind of stage here. So we, we hypothesize, can we, so we, we all know probably that CA125 is not ADL in detecting this minimal residual disease or recurrence. And we hypothesize, can we find new markers or combinations of markers or markers that could be combined with CA125 or other markers that are out there to detect this minimal residual disease better? So here the hypothesis could be you could extend the number of um, chemotherapy cycles from usually six to seven, possibly longer, reducing tumor burden ideally more. Or you could detect um, recurrence of the disease earlier. And the hypothesis there then is that this could potentially improve survival. Also, I put here this in question marks, this is a bit debatable, of course, and would need to be tested in clinical trials. CA125 in that context, treatment on early rise of CA125, if that improves survival, is highly um, controversial. Most clinical trials likely failed in that context, although if you read them more carefully, it may have not been conducted in the most ideal manner, let's put it that way. So anyhow, that so our goal is, find marker that predict tumor burden better. And here's how we started this initially. It's very technical still, but I think it's an interesting strategy. And this was all done by a phenomenal um, former PhD student, Ankit Sinha, now a, a postdoc in the man lab in my old hometown in, in Munich. So here, here's what we did. So we made use of large um, living biobanks of PDX models in which the Princess Margaret Cancer Center invested 10 years ago when Ben Neal actually was the law director. And so here we actually tagged on to um, PDX models that Laurie Ailes and Ben Neal initially developed and here they published it in that PNAS paper from 2010. So we went actually back and kind of reestablished these models through IP engraftment. So in the original papers, there were memory fat, um, fat pad engrafted. So we did IP engraftment here. So that has a much lower take rate and a much slower um, tumor growth kinetics um, than in the original paper. Nevertheless, um, here we easily um, succeeded in generating 12 unique models. So these are PDX models from 12 distinct patients. Each of their tumor pieces injected in multiple animals. And then at presentation, um, so these animals present again, lots of tumor load, most of them have ascites, kind of um, present similar to a hybrid serous patient. So Ankit then surgically resected these tumors, collected the blood from these animals, and then also collected blood from unengrafted um, animals, so control animals. We then lysed these proteins or in, in serum, um, just digested them and added basically right at that very beginning, we added a yeast glycoprotein invertase, so the gene name is SUC2. So that allows you to control for any type of variability that you have in these pretty complex um, um, analysis schemes. We digested um, these proteins then to peptides, and then we were interested particularly in isolating um, um, glycopeptides. And we use this um, hydrocyte chemistry down here where basically through oxidation, cis diols get oxidized to aldehydes. You couple them on these hydrocyte beads from a hydrosome. You can now rigorously wash these peptides from the magnetic bead. So you'd expect that maybe approximately 20% of your triptych peptides could potentially carry a, a glycam. Um, so you reduce your complexity dramatically that way and you also potentially enrich for a subset of the proteome that you're particularly interested in here. So surface exposed or classically secreted molecules, proteins often carry an n um, and, and then there's an enzyme, PNGSF, that cuts between that asparagin on, on a peptide backbone and that sugar um, um, residue, that first sugar residue. Um, releasing these peptides from this magnetic bead um, support and also converting that asparagine to an aspartic acid. That's a one dot mass shift in a consensus sequence, which is asparagine followed by any amino acid, but proline followed by a serine threonine. So you have actually very high specificity 
and detecting these formally glycosylated peptides now. And then we analyze all these 36 samples by a classic um, shotgun proteomics approach. And then we, we did kind of um, target analysis. So we compared these samples and you can imagine there's certain quadrants within this Venn diagram that are particularly interesting to you. And then we also assign species um, to these detected peptides. So you're engrafting a human primary tumor into a mouse host. So you can hopefully distinguish computationally these peptides um, at that stage. Not perfect, but relatively well. I'll show you this later. And then these peptides are immediately potential assays or, or assays for the development or, or targets for the development of targeted proteomics assays. And here we developed um, parallel reaction monitoring, so PRM assays. And then in this proof of concept, we applied them to two independent cohort of longitudinally collected um, serum samples from high grade serous ovarian cancer patients at these different um, stages throughout disease progression. Okay, so here's some um, results from this project. So we detected around 3,900 unique glycosides. So it's slightly less unique um, triptych peptides. And here you can see um, in what type of subcellular localizations um, these, these um, peptides or their proteins map to. So nine peptides detected to the spike in invertase, large proportions. So this is unique peptides and then the number in the brackets is unique gene products. Um, a large number of classically secreted proteins and huge number of course of, of transmembrane spanning um, proteins where the majority of the glycosides are in the ectodomain and then somewhat more, a very small number of somewhat more dubious um, glycosides um, in, in, in the set of 3,900 peptides. And here you can see now how these unique peptides and gene products again, so the two numbers split among these three different sample types, the tumor, the matching, um, serum from these engrafted animals and the unengrafted um, serum samples. And as I said, right, so this tumor here is a mixed species tissue, contains human engrafted samples from this primary surgical um, resection and, and mouse host. And from, from HNEs of these tumors, maybe 60, 70% of that tumor is, is of human origin. So uh, without belaboring this too much, so in our, our proteomics data was searched against a concatenated human and mouse sequence database. And then at that level, we parse all these peptides in a database in our lab, and then we can assign them simply um, to a species, a human unique peptide, a mouse human conserved peptide, or a mouse unique peptide, and here are these yeast peptides. And then of course, you know, protein sequence databases, they're definitely not perfect. Um, and they definitely do not capture the full complexity of a mouse or human proteome. So we played around with different, extensively more comprehensive databases, such as predicted sequences or custom databases that we generated from, from SNP data from, from that particular mouse strain in which we engrafted. And you can see there's sometimes peptides, for example, here, 34 of these 1705 in a more complex database that could also be assigned to a, to a mouse species. So they basically go into this middle bucket um, where we can't distinguish them. Nevertheless, you have around 1600 or so peptides that, can, that you can assign with good confidence to a species and then around 600 that are conserved. Which is interesting actually, so that proportion is very different if you do this on non-glycopeptide um, approaches. If you do this just on triptych peptides, that middle region is going to be much, much larger. So you have a much harder time to distinguish on these species if you do it without that glycocapture um, strategy that I showed you. And then here, a couple interesting observations. So here now, there are 1,600 or so peptides that I detected in serum. And here we just blot them by intensity, MS1 intensity, kind of a quasi uh, um, abundance of that peptide. And then down here in that stacked bar chart, we put them into bins um, of the 230 most intense and so on. And you can see 
Um, as, you, as your peptides are less intense, the proportion of human unique um, peptides increases. And to me, that makes sense, right? I mean, you're engrafting a tumor, you wouldn't ex a human tumor, you wouldn't expect that every protein in that tumor gets secreted, makes it into mouse blood, and is detectable by your method. So certainly, um, they're in the lower uh, abundance range. Um, alternatively, if you do that same kind of analysis on the tissue, you don't see that difference. Because there's nothing that would, again, intuitively that makes sense, nothing that suggests that a mouse or human proteome in that mixed tissue would be biased one or the other way. So the abundance of these proteins sh should be independent, likely of the species globally speaking. And you can, and you can see that here. Okay, and then we took this data and maybe went a little bit overboard, but tried to design, um, tried to select peptides for the development of targeted um, PRM assays. And of course, you can imagine here in this Venn diagram, the 649, so that quadrant of peptides that you detect both in the tumor as well as in the serum, they're the most interesting, um, obviously. We kind of, like I said, went a little bit overboard and said, oh, let's look at these tumor um, peptides as well, because maybe we just missed them in, in shotgun proteomics and with a targeted assay, maybe we more sensitive. So we, we went, as I said, a little crazy here. So anyhow, so there's, um, first we take these peptides and map them to a human um, species. So there's 319 from this quadrant and about a thousand or so from this. And then if you build MRM or PR masses, there are some type of biophysical um, constraints that you usually put on your peptide. So we want them fully triptic with no missed cleavage site. We want ideally as little possible amino acids that could carry a variable modification. For example, serine for phosphorus. So not completely perfect. So we have some methionine containing peptides in here and you'll see they cause a bit of problems. You want their length seven to 21 amino acids. That's more financial. Synthesizing these is quite expensive. And then we also added some, some peptides from our internal control. So for these 319, there's exactly 166 that follow these type of criteria. From this quadrant, there's many more. So there's, I think, 600 or so, as much as I recall. So here we actually were a little bit more selective and we asked the question, if multiple peptides map to the same gene product, give us the most intense peptide. Here the hypothesis would be that gives you the most um, sensitive PRM assay. That gives you 218. So that makes 384 total peptides mapping to so much genes. And then of course we synthesize them as stable isotope labeled peptides. As I said, some of them contain a methionine that could be single or doubly oxidized. So now we added them into our assay, right? So the, the oxidation value is not stoichiometric but it could happen. So that blows up actually a number of assays to 450. So we actually now try to build a multiplex PRM assay for 450 targets, light and heavy, um, including we also spiked in these index retention time peptides that allow you to kind of control for your LC um, conditions. And then we did all kinds of um, optimization of these assays. I don't want to belabor these here in detail, but in reality, you have to realize when you have that many targets, that assay will certainly not be optimized, every one of them. You, there's just a balancing act you have to play between reasonable and completely going overboard. So nevertheless, we played around with um, chromatography. And you can see this here behaves kind of how you would expect it in theory. As the um, chromatographic retention gets longer, the intensity of your peaks on average gets lower. You, nevertheless, you're recording more data points over peak illusion. So you have to play this game a little bit, right? How well do you separate? How many peaks do you get over elution of the peptide? How intense signal to noise wise is that island? They are going not always in the same direction. So I always call this semi-objective selection. Played around a bit with um, collision energies that doesn't make a huge difference. Certainly played around a little bit with specificity. So we did not generate 450 full out response curves, but in a small scale, um, and we did this. And then we applied it to this initial cohort. 
10 samples, five time points, so 50 serum samples, and applied this massive 900 target um, multiplex PRM assay. Down here, you just see what these chromatograms approximately look like. The red peaks are your IRT peptides. And here's our cohort, our 50 samples. So this is um, human serum samples with a clinical C125 ELISA. And you can see is this kind of theoretic curve is high at presentation, goes down after surgery, goes further down after chemo, stays kind of flat, and then comes up. Of course, for just for, for clearness here, so I mean, this, this x-axis is squished together, right? So there, there's a time scale to this that every patient may have a different time scale. Just for simplicity, we compress that. And then we ran these 450 assays in duplicates, um, processing duplicates. So independently processing these samples and running them, not just injection replicates. You can see they're reasonably um, reproducible, normalized to their, their um, stable isotope spike in. And of course, your invertase peptides behave quite well. Okay, and then we mined these data. And here again, you can see kind of the details how we, we did it. It's not so important, but we tried to uh, try to mine our data using this kind of a slope profile. And what we wanted to see in peptides is that they go down after surgery, chemo. And then in contrast to CA125 that stays kind of flat here, they should be coming up and then go further up in recurrence. And, and now you throw 450 against the wall and not so many will stick. And the reason for that is the following. So I think 350 or so, we could easily detect the diagnosis, lost them afterwards. About 200 of those, we could detect all the way down to, um, we could see them go down um, in, in chemotherapy. We never picked them up again. And then a small subset, 27, followed this, this um, profile that we um, wanted them to follow, um, especially with going up in this post-chemo to remission stage where, as I said, again, C125 stays flat um, um, under those conditions. And we synthesized these 27 peptides as highly purified aqua peptides. So, so now you could, in theory, do like a quasi-absolute um, type quantification. Um, applied them to a second cohort, further optimized these assays. So everyone that has done um, targeted assays knows the less targets you have, the more luxury you have to play around and, and tweak your assay for retention time and iron and fill times and, and whatnot to make that. And, and, re, and also generated response curves here to experimentally determine linearity and LOT, LOQ, all these kind of um, neat little things in, in these assays. And you can see here now you in your processing replicates, they're, they're tightly um, robust. Um, um, doesn't mean they're accurate, but they're robust. And then here we compared it to a CA125 ELISA at this diagnosis stage. So you can see again, quite nicely correlated, except for two samples. So one patient had very low CA125, we couldn't pick it up. Um, um, it's that one peptide that we used for CA125. One had very high concentration by ELISA, gave us very low signal or concentration on the PRM assay, and that could very well be um, an issue of proteoforms and is a heavily glycosylated um, protein, and we use a completely different way of pulling it out and detecting it as compared to the ELISA. But, you know, we went back multiple times, always got that result interesting, actually. Don't know why, but interesting for sure. And then we, again, as I said, applied these 27 now to that second cohort, and then four reproducibly um, repro gave us, again, that slope profile that we were interested in. So these are now four markers that look in, they are years away um, from being a biomarker that could come into the clinic, but they have a expression profile that looks curious and interesting, potentially, detecting minimal residual disease or recurrence better than CA125. And I'll show you in the last slide of that part of the talk, uh, what we're gonna do with them now. So we're obviously trying to now validate them in another cohort 
further improving these PRM assays, and it's a much larger cohort this time. So we should be able to validate if they really have this kind of a slow profile and how they compare to CA125 in, in that cohort. But what else did we learn in this project? So we learned a couple things. I mean, the first thing we learned, it's actually kind of an interesting approach um, using these patient-derived xenografts and, and glyco proteomic type analysis to detect tumor secreted proteins in blood using this kind of species assignment and specific enrichment of glycopeptides. And as I said, um, Princess Margaret has spent a lot of efforts to generating large cohorts um, of PDX models. So we now went to the Living Biobank and obtained a, a panel um, of these PDX models. And now there are some interesting questions. Um, from this second kind of screen that we can do. A, we can ask, okay, what actually makes it out of a tumor and is detectable in blood? Is this, are these always the same proteins? Are there different proteins? Can we potentially, you know, those that are always detected, are they, could they potentially be interesting, sensitive um, um, biomarkers for early detection? Those that are unique to a, to a um, PDX type, could they have more specificity? And then, then we can also, of course, ask the question here. Maybe it's, a, it's kind of a caveat of this project, but we, at least from a biological perspective, we can ask this, will engraftment site affect what makes it into the blood? So as I said to you, high-grade zeros, they're IP engrafted. This GBM models, they're from, from my close collaborator, Sheila Singh at McMaster. They're actually a true orthotopic model. They're engrafted straight into the brain. All these other models in the living biobank, they're sub-Q engraftments. So that will be quite interesting to see how that engraftment and local tumor environment contributes to the release and detection of tumor-derived proteins in mouse blood. And Minusha, a new student in the lab, actually is working on this. And you know, funnily, she's actually Ankit's cousin. So the project stays within the family. And then um, Minusha also has like a second um, part of, of her thesis. So one thing we also noticed when we looked at this, and in this original paper, we, we didn't look at that at all. Lots of interesting information in the PDX tumor glycoproteome from a biological perspective. So these are you know, model systems, but they're more sophisticated 3D model systems as compared to your cell lines. Um, maybe even more sophisticated than, a, than an organoid a model to a certain degree. It's in a living animal. So, so if, for example, in that PDX tumor, we detected around 2,000 glycoproteins. And these are highly enriched in plasma membrane proteins. So obviously, we don't have the spatial resolution here, but by annotation, they're, they're plasma membrane proteins. And a large number of them can be mapped to a human origin again, as I showed you before. So now we took all this data and we kind of integrated it with some pretty interesting human um, high-grade serous ovarian cancer proteomes. There's several studies from CPTAC, from Hui Sang's group and at Johns Hopkins. There's also some interesting laser capture microdissection um, um, data sets from the Mann and Langley group. And so we integrated all this data with us. And then in parallel, we performed like a, using the same chemistry, but we, in a, in a spatially, spatially resolved uh, setup, we perform cell surface capture. So this method that Baron Walscheid's group um, developed five or six years ago, and we applied it to a subset of specifically selected cell models. So here are a couple of, of high quality, high grade serous ovarian cancer cell lines, um, some immortalized fallopian tube epithelial cells, as well as some patient-derived cancer-associated fibroblasts, so the most common subtype within the tumor microenvironment. And then if you mishy-mashy all this together, integrate all this together, selected actually 386 of these surface molecules for a targeted CRISPR screen in these models. And we're asking the question, how many of them show some essentiality, specific essentiality in these models? And can we then study them in a more detailed biological manner? Why are they there? What are they doing? Using, again, model systems, very nice model system that L'Oreal's lab has generated. It's just very simple 3D spheroid models of these cell lines. But um, you can spike in um, 
these cancer-associated fibroblasts and dramatically actually change on the phenotype of how these spheroids grow. You can then, of course, generate inducible knockdowns of your markers of interest and study growth and invasion, et cetera, within these models. So that could be then interesting from a biological perspective, but also from a therapeutic perspective, where we have some type of collaborations with industry to generate antibody drug conjugates or you know, T cell engagers to some of these um, surface markers that we are interested in. You can also imagine that's where it get, becomes really slow, your projects. Every single surface molecule will be an individual project. So to summarize this um, project and speed up a little bit, so we were quite excited in using these um, PDX models to detect tumor-derived proteins in blood. Um, we have done a small proof of concept study to verify some of these in patient bloods. And we're interested in detecting candidates um, for early detection of hybrid serous ovarian cancer recurrence. We have now secured with my clinical collaborator, Marcus Bernardini, here at Princess Mario Cancer Center, a larger cohort, 117 unique patients, 702 distinct serum samples with five to eight data points through progression of the disease. They all have matching clinical C125 ELISA data. So a new postdoc in the lab will take these four markers that I showed you, further optimize these PRM assays and apply them to this cohort to see, can it be done? And now moving on to the second. So this is now all kind of very early, most of it unpublished data. So as Sharon said, we work in the introduction, we work for many years on, on prostate cancer, urine-based biomarkers. And here, just a bit of background. So most of you will know that current diagnostic and prognostic protocols in prostate cancer, which combine a serum measurement of prostate-specific antigen, a digital rectal exam, and a needle biopsy are very inaccurate in predicting a patient's risk. They're good in detecting it, but they're not good in telling you have a high uh, aggressive or more indolent disease. And that leads to a traumatic over and under treatment of many of these men. Furthermore, of course, these biopsies are problematic in itself because three to 4% of men actually end up hospitalized, many even with severe kind of um, um, complications such as sepsis from this biopsy. And there's about a million needle biopsies performed in the US per year. So you can see it's a significant um, problem, clinical problem, these biopsies. So our group and many, many other groups uh, around the world have hypothesized that molecular biomarkers, I believe that has to be in combination with improving imaging approaches in prostate cancer, such as MPMRI, could improve on this decision process. And we have been doing this through molecular profiling of prostate cancer tissues. I assume that Paul talked about this in the, in the last seminar that he hosted, but also prox prostate proximal fluids post your urine and EPS. I'll show you in the next slide what these are um, at various level of the central dogma, DNA, RNA, protein. And we're not forgetting metabolites. We just have not gotten to those yet. They're also quite interesting. And our clinical goals are the early detection of aggressive disease. So that could either be at diagnosis, triaging men towards definitive treatment versus active surveillance, or in the context of an active surveillance protocol, who should stay on or who should come off, hopefully reducing the repeat biopsy requirements, needle biopsy requirements. So here just a little of a background. So the prostate is, a, is an exocrine tissue, right, that produces fluids. And, and you can see it here in this cartoon that um, a student in the lab drew. They have, these little, they have these little ductal structures that contain multiple layers, two layers of epithelial cells. And these luminal epithelial cells, those are the ones that are thought to transform when cancer develops. The normal function is actually to secrete molecules into proteins and other molecules into these little ducts that actually um, release into the urethra and combined with semen actually during um, fertilization where they have normal biological functions, pH buffering, immune modulations and um, proteolytic activities. 
So now there's, there's two ways you can get to these fluids, either in what we call direct express prosthetic secretion or prosthetic secretions. You know, for short, I keep calling them DPS. So that is the fluid that's made by this exocrine tissue. It's extremely rich in proteins and other release molecules. So it could be an interesting source for biomarker discovery. Problem, that's a very rarely biobanked and not really that applicable to routine clinical analysis. It's usually only collected just prior to radical prostatectomy. So when these men under anesthesia, just before their prostate is removed, you, the clinician can collect this fluid. Comes in a second flavor. So this is posterior urine and very important. So that is the first flow, first catch, 50 milliliters urine following a digital rectal examination. It can be collected frequently and is applicable to clinical implementation. As a matter of fact, PCA3, the non-coding, um, long non-coding RNA is actually performed in posterior urine. And here, just to further, further belabor this point a little bit, so this is data from Martin Sanders group at um, Emory University. He looked at RNA expression in posterior urine. You can see they're highly enriched in prostate-specific RNAs. And similarly, our own data shows that too. So this is data in collaboration with a clinical colleague of mine, um, Stanley Liu at Sunnybrook Hospital. So when he sees patients, he collected before and after DRE on the same visit um, urines. And you can see here just a number of well-known prostate enriched or specific proteins, ACPP. This is here, actually is PSMA, KLK3 is PSA. They dramatically go up as a result of this DRA, suggesting that these fluids are indeed capable of detecting proteins that are directly released from that organ and detectable in that media. So in posterior urine or direct EPS. Okay, so here, this is what we've done before we got to what I show you, what we've been up to in the last two years. So we spent several years on a small scale profiling these type of fluids. So initially here, we looked at direct EPS from organ confined versus extracapsular extension prostate cancer. So it's an independent risk factor for aggressive disease, found proteins, built MRM assays, applied them to two medium, smallish sized cohorts, asking the questions, can we find markers that distinguish um, um, benign controls from cancers? Or harder question, distinguish organ confined from extracapsular questions. And then, you know, in collaboration with the Boutros lab, build various, using various computational tools, build small combinations or signatures of peptides that indeed could do this. And that was kind of nice. So that kind of convinced us, okay, this may actually be doable. So the technology may be there where we can ask these questions. But the first thing we realized, A, we got to analyze way more patients and we probably got to come up with methods that allow us to deal with these urines in a more systematic manner. So in these original papers, we kind of used these complicated filter-based strategies to to kind of enrich um, and, uh, and isolate proteins from urines. We then tested two different methods that could potentially be automated, even in liquid handling robots. C8 beats and this method that Hannah Steen's group in Boston developed, Emstrom. That's what we actually then ended up using. So these are 96 volt plates with a porous PVDF membrane on the bottom. PVDF has very high affinity to proteins and you can automate this, um, this approach. And here you can see how we do it in a very simple way. And hopefully in the future with, with robots as well. So you buy these plates and you get like a, 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 a manifold that, uh, that attaches to a vacuum in the lab. And then you basically fill your urine into these plates and use the vacuum basically to suck the fluid through, bind your proteins to PVDF, to that PVDF membrane wash away inorganic salts, urea, et cetera, that you have in urine, and then digest directly on that membrane in a very small volume. So you can increase also that, that or decrease the time that you need for digestion. And then here we kind of in a centrifuge and purify these peptides um, using um, SIP tips basically that we make our same, but that, can, that we make ourselves. That can also be done in a, in a centrifuge, of course. And you can see, you can dramatically reduce the volume that you need 
um, to analyze these samples while analyzing 96 samples at the same time. So you can really quickly improve your um, increase your throughput. And here you can see just numbers how this you know improvement in sample prep and of course um, better LCMS technologies improves your kind of detection depth um, in these fluids from the low hundreds to the almost two thousands. And you still see lots of variability. So that's kind of your clinical samples. Um, you'll always see that um, in clinical samples. And here, this is now the project that we've just completed. So that's, that's done by two phenomenal trainees. So Amanda, a PhD student in my lab, and so you as a biostatistician in, in Paul Butcher's lab at UCLA. So they analyzed 676 patients, unique patients, um, with 1,600 or so unique raw files. So there's lots of kind of overlaps and samples that are being analyzed at different sites and, and technical um, um, vignettes in here that I won't go into detail, but just a quick overview. So we have some tissues, some from previous data, some new data that we use as a background comparison. And then we have large cohorts of direct um, expressed prosthetic secretions from a collaborator at the Eastern Virginia Medical School and matching urines from that same um, biobank, as well as uh, uh, some samples from our clinical cohort, uh, clinical um, colleagues, Stan Lou here in Toronto and Sunnybrook. And we isolated um, also various extracellular vesicle populations from these cords, including samples where we, and I showed you this, where we have pre versus post, as well as longitudinal samples um, from, these, from these patients. So here you can just see, because I'm running, I think, out of time. Um, here you can just see how these cords actually compare. So I'll, I'll spend some time on this up here. So that's a really, really interesting cohort that we have here. So we have direct EPSs analyzed at two sites in Toronto and Virginia. Some are overlapping. We have direct EPSs that are, that are um, overlapping partially with urines. So you can ask how is a direct EPS proteome representative to a urine EPS proteome. And again, we do this at multiple different sites. And most importantly, so we have this over all different risk groups. So from a Gleason grade group one, all the way to a Gleason grade group five. And it's a surgical cohort with a seven year follow-up time. So we have data at the diagnostic stage as well as at the pathology, pathology stage. So it's a, it's a very nicely, richly annotated cohort that allows us now to push this to the next level. I'll show you vignettes from these two cohorts. I do it really quickly now. So here's just some technical little things that everyone that does this should be thinking about. So as I said, some samples where we had an aliquot analyzed by us in Toronto or analyzed in Virginia by a different person at a different time run on a slightly different mass spectrometer. You can see here how they correlate. So, you know, they're positively correlated, not perfect, but they're reasonably positively correlated. Processing replicates, that's done in our lab. We analyzed an aliquot from the same sample in different wells on the m strand plate. Again, slightly better and positively correlated. And then the, um, the Virginia group, the technical replicates. And you can see again here similar. And if you combine it all, you can see how these, how these sample um, types correlate with each other. So between a technical and a processing replicate, they're highly correlated, there's no difference. Samples that were analyzed at different sites by different people and different mass specs, uh, slightly less correlated. And then random, 1,000 one-to-one correlation, this highly diverse cord, they're much less correlated and they better be, um, or you wouldn't find any differences between these, um, these clinical cords. And now I just go, two minutes go with one little vignette before I cut it short. So here just I'll show you some very preliminary data from, from these 148 samples that were analyzed um, by Amanda in, in our lab here in Toronto. And you can see here how these samples split. So here we classified them by classic D'Amico criteria into low, intermediate, high risk, and they split as you would expect. A low risk patient following surgery, is a much lower likelihood of developing biochemical recurrence compared to an intermediate or high risk. Median follow-up, I think now is actually over seven years. So obviously it's a, Quartz keep maturing over time. And here just for all the techies, show you some of these, these controls that we're putting in. 
So here's how we process in these direct EPS. We take 15 micrograms of direct EPS and 200 microliters, add invertase, bind it to the membrane, digest it for four hours, collect the peptides, spike in IRT peptides, load an aliquot on the mass spec. So you can see your invertase, so that's your spike in control that goes through the full um, um, setup, pr pretty tight, um, over 148 runs, randomly um, analyzed. Same with the IRT peptides. And then we took, so we detected about 45,000 unique peptides and we asked at the peptide level, how many of them are differentially expressed between a low risk patient, likely not requiring any intervention at that time, whereas an intermediate high risk, most likely requiring intervention. You can see some of them upregulated in your, in your low high risk, intermediate risk, some are down regulated. And even and in down here, you can see how reproducibly they're detected over the 148 runs. So they're highly reproducibly detected um, over these 148 runs. One thing that's really interesting, proteins, so the, the proteins where these peptides map to in the high risk cohort, they're highly enriched in immune and iron metabolism actually pathways versus proteins that are downregulated. That's where all your classic prostate markers are, PSA, ACPP. So they're actually performing um, in the opposite, they're moving in the opposite direction of what you see actually in blood. And if you think about this for a while, this does make sense on why this is the case. And then we can play that exact same game um, with, a, with a 115 samples that were analyzed in Virginia. And they detected a little bit less um, peptides than us, but those that pass these exact same filters, they're actually highly correlated between our two cohorts. Um, so there's about 400 or so, um, three, 400 in this cohort. Those that are purple or pink here, um, they're detected in every single sample in in our lab, as well as in the Virginia group. So here immediately you can see it's probably possible jumping back and forth between these cohorts and selecting um, peptides for further development of PRM assays and validation in a pretty rigorous manner. And with this, since I wanna have some time for discussion, I'll jump through this and go to um, the acknowledgement section. So I apologize for being slow as usual. So here I leave it with uh, a nice picture of Toronto. So here Princess Mary Cancer Center right here in the heart of downtown Toronto. So if you ever come to Toronto, please visit us. Um, here's our funding sources. Of course, without those, none of this would be possible. So we've been lucky to um, receive, now we, uh, my keynote. Um, crashed. So anyhow, that's a, that's a perfect sign for me to stop. So basically, um, you see there's lots of people, all our trainees, of course, and my collaborators require lots of acknowledgement. And with that, I'll take your questions. And my keynote crashed at the end. That was a sign to get out of here. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for that um, outstanding um, talk about your work. Um, if you have questions, please go ahead and either come off mute and ask them, or you can put them in the Q&A and I'd be happy to read them. So let's give people a minute. And I can open Any this questions? Okay, maybe while people are thinking about questions, um, I, I, I can start with something. I'm curious, can you elaborate a little bit about in the prostate cancer urine work, why you expect, or why you're not surprised that proteins that are down in urine are not elevated, are the ones that are elevated in the blood. Think about it, right? I mean, and, you know, what's the Gleason score, right? I mean, so a Gleason score, has the Gleason score goes from one to five. This is the differentiation of that foci, of that asini. So if you section it, you see it, right? In a normal prostate, you almost have these little holes, these asini in it. And as these epithelia are now um, um, transform and form these cancers, these ASMI fill out. So that normal function of that prostate to secrete into these ASMI that goes into the urethra becomes compromised. But you know, new blood vessels are formed to support that tumor. So now you have probably this leakage that goes into the blood where it usually shouldn't be going. Um, so it, it goes up in the blood, but that classic kind of cellular structure histology 
becomes compromised and this classic secretory function likely becomes also compromised. So in the urine where you would collect it through the urethra and or posterior urine, that protein goes down. It's traumatic actually. They go the exact opposite directions, possibly actually with a better sensitivity, right? So unfortunately the slide crashed on me. So if you look at PSA in a BPH or Gleason Gray group one, two, three, there's very little difference. Maybe at four or five, it starts to go up a little bit, right? It's this poor sensitivity specificity issue. Versus in urine, you can see this kind of stepwise kind of down regulation from at least one to a two, to a three, to a four, to a five. Um, still lots of variability, but exact opposite direction actually. That makes sense, interesting. Um, okay, other questions um, from Parag Malik. Um, were there any general properties that you observed about the tumor proteins found in blood, size, abundance in tumor, et cetera? So you're talking about, I assume that first project, that's the only one where we looked at blood. We didn't look at that. We looked at this. So it's a, it's a good question, actually. Um, so we looked at this very specifically in, in the last second project. Is there any difference in hydrophobicity or size of the parent protein or proteins that are detected in urine versus direct EPS versus EVs versus tissues? There's actually none. I mean, there are these curves. If you blot them as histograms, they look identical, um, which is a bit surprising. Maybe we're super biased in our proteomics approaches, the way we extract and digest and run it and pick it up in a mass spec. Um, yeah. Good questions. Hey, unfortunately, unfortunately, in the microbes, I haven't seen Fantastic. Thank you. Um, question from Nick Riley. Have you tried MS Stern workflow with other biofluids other than urine? Can it be applied to other types of liquid biopsies? Yes, it can. So we've applied it to urine and, and, and direct EPS. We've also applied it to CSF recently. Uh, works quite well in CSF as well. So we have not applied it to blood. It can. So if you go to the original paper from Hanos Group, I think they applied it to cell lysate, serum, urine, and CSF, and it works in all of them. And there's all kinds of variants of these. I think there's this S-trap that people are using now as well. Um, that is a so Emster and what I like, you can just buy these plates from Millipro. Obviously, it's commercial as well, but there's no like real kit involved, right? S trap, we've tried it. That is a kit, costs quite a bit of money. In our hands, I know people, I mean, I may be very unpopular here. In our hands, I was not super impressed with it, even though people seem to like it. So we had very odd observations in S trap of certain valves just failing on us for no rhyme or reason. Um, so that may be us and maybe we haven't done it full due diligence, but M Stern in our hand for these fluids works quite well and, and they're quite cheap actually. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna pick your brain about that later. Um, I'd like to, Arut, did you have a question? Do you wanna come off mute and ask your question? Uh, oh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you. It's, it was a very nice talk. Uh, so the first part of the talk, you used a PDX tumor. That patient-derived tumor is one, uh, came from one patient. And then, uh, so over the period, that tumor, once you implanted in the mouse, is mutated. Have you checked that stability? And then second question, extension of Sharon Petri, like kind of, the protein which you collected the last part, 3.4 kilodalton, I think you used to collect the protein or concentrate the protein. Such a small protein, it is really very interesting how it is not mixed uniform, only the last portion of the urine concentrated. So that's second question. Okay, so let me try to answer. So the first question, 
It, so if I understand you correct, is the PDX tumor genomics um, or transcriptomics reflective of the primary tumor when it was in a patient? So in our project, we didn't, but Ben Niels and L'Oreal's group did this quite extensively. So they looked, obviously, you know, um, ovarian cancer is a C-type cancer, so there's lots of copy number changes. So they performed copy number profiling in the primary tumor and the, and the PDX is highly reproducible. Um, and these couple mutations that you have, like P53, that are all mutated in P53, that's also still in there. So that has been done. So suggesting that, you know, it's a high fidelity model. But, but of course, keep in mind, it's a model still, right? I mean, the immune system is kind of missing. It's, it, it's not exactly the same, but it's, it's, it's relatively good fidelity. So the second prod question that you had, so I'm not fully sure I understood it. So, I mean, back in the days, so in, in our original papers, we started with five to 10 milliliters of urine. And you know, urine is, is not an easy fluid to work with. You know, people never actually admit to this. Um, it's highly diluted. It's quite stable, but it's highly diluted. So we actually, back in the days concentrated five to 10 milliliters of urine with a, I think it's a three KD um, filter. So basically went from five uh, milliliters to 500 microliters, took those 500 microliters, methanol precipitated them overnight, got a protein pellet, digested that protein pellet. Really tedious. Um, so moving forward, we didn't do this. So we used this m and you put 200 microliters in the m plate, all peptides or proteins bind to it. You wash away organic salts and you digest them straight off that uh, membrane and elute them with high organics. Um, again, looking at hydrophobicities and molecular, um, molecular um, weight, distributions of the parent proteins looks exactly what you would expect from a from a um, looking at a uniprot database so it doesn't look there's any biases that we could see did that okay, answer so, thank you uh, so basically i thought like this three kilo dalton over the period aggregated and you got or something or three kilo dalton uh, you know uniformly maintained same molecular weight no, so the, the flow through we threw away. I mean, you're probably asking an interesting question, right? There's probably all kinds of natural peptides that are below three kilodalton. So those we, we may have thrown away in, in the old protocol. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, so we're slightly over time, but I will take one last question um, because Dan Cap has been waiting patiently. Um, exciting work on biomarkers in HG serous ovarian cancer. Other groups are investigating the role of cell-free tumor DNA for biomarker of response. Are you planning on any comparison studies between these two general approaches? Yeah, it's, it's a nice, it's a good question, Daniel. I mean, obviously in Princess Margaret, right, we have quite a few people. I mean, we have Scott Bratman and Daniel DeCavallo and they're working all on ctDNA. Some of these technologies actually were built in Stanford, right, from, from Scott Bratman when he was a postdoc there. So we haven't done it yet. Um, but in the CSF project that I told you about in GBMs, we're planning on doing this. So there we will. And in the urine project, the only thing I can tell you, so Stan Lewis group works a lot on microRNA. So we're trying to, and, and Stan Lew and Paul Boutros had a nice paper in JNCI looking at microRNA signatures. And some of these urines are overlapping, perfectly overlapping with ours. So we will actually try to integrate that. They're good questions, right? Sometimes you make a complicated problem even more complicated. So it's not as, as super straightforward, but yeah, very interesting. Needs to be done. Sounds very exciting. Okay, on that, um, let's thank our speaker again. Apologies for the questions that we couldn't get to. I'm sure um, Thomas would be happy to answer by email um, if you really wanted to follow up. Um, but thank you again so much. Thanks. Sorry that I'm always mm -hmm. slow. I really need to speak some faster. <laughs> no right. I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much. Sounds great. Thank you. Um,